Oh my gosh, it's so fun to get to do that. <laughs> I have missed that so much, you know. In fact, that song, it's really funny, as I was talking to uh, Tom and Brad and Char as we were planning the service back on Tuesday, and, and he was, uh, they were talking about, you know, what, what would I play a song and what song would I play? It, this song flashed through my mind because it's Lent and uh, the passage that Mike read just a minute ago about Jesus not washing his hands in the presence of these Pharisees, and the Pharisees just couldn't hear what he had to say or weren't interested just because he hadn't washed his hands. It dawned on me. And then I realized uh, after telling them that uh, you know, this would, might be a good song, would fit with the theme, that I wrote that song four years ago for this service on a Tuesday, and Elizabeth Wills sang it that Sunday. And I'd never played the song <laughs> since I wrote it. So uh, I've spent a little time this week trying to remember it. And, and so cool to come in, as we always did so for so long, to write a song and, then, and to rehearse it at 8 a.m. on a Sunday morning with this band and get to play it together. It's such a thank you guys so much for making that possible. The passage, though, is... Um, it's a good one for what I want to share with you today, and, uh, oh, but I have to take a moment because I'm still just kind of like, wow, it's so cool to be here and to see so many familiar faces and the journey that we've shared for all those years, and Tom, and, uh, thanks so much again for inviting me to come. Uh, I, I have, as you know, as Tom said, I've recently written a book, um, I finished the book. I started writing the book probably five, six years ago. I took a three-month sabbatical from my role here at one point, uh, and the, the First Methodist was so gracious to give me that three months to go work on my book. And I did. I wrote like 300 pages uh, during that three months, and I threw it all away <laughs> because I, I didn't feel like I had found quite the words yet to be able to explain why this stuff was so important to me and why I had seen it make such a difference with so many people in the work that I was doing um, uh, in my counseling, consulting. And so I want to try to share a little bit of that with you today. In the context of this passage, though, I would say that the simplest way to explain my book is that we all, like those Pharisees, have a consciousness, a human consciousness, that operates in a particular way. And we can't change that. The way that consciousness and human beings evolved is not that unlike some other creatures on the planet, but it is so much advanced from other creatures in its capacity for abstract imagery. Right now, if I tell you, close your eyes, and I want you to picture God. What picture did you have, right? How many of you kind of had a, a masculine image for that that came up for you as you closed your eyes? So we've all been given these images from the culture that we've grown up in, the faith that we've been nurtured in, and probably from before we can really even recognize that we were learning. We were picking up images like shells on a beach, as my old friend Bill Thrash used to say. And if he were here right now, Bill passed away a long time ago, about 10 years ago, 11 years ago. He would say that that picking up of those images that you and I picked up was a pretty just fortunate or unfortunate circumstance for us. We picked up some that were really helpful, and we picked up some that weren't very helpful. And some of the images that we pick up are limiting to our experience of life, and some of them open us to the experience of life. Wouldn't you say? And so, where you got your images and where I got my images um, is somewhat of a random and fortunate kind of thing, but we use those images to be able to recognize the present. Right now, I have an image in my mind that allows me to look right here and go, Harley, okay. it's Harley, right? <laughs> And when I see Harley, I don't have to think, who is that? Because automatically my mind does that for me, right? All the time. 
And that's how we can tell what cups and cabbages and cars are. Right? But all of those images that serve to create this kind of stability in our lives where we kind of know things, we feel like we know things, are incom- all those images are incomplete. But that's not what our automated, habituated kind of consciousness wants us to think. Because if we walked around all the time wondering what things were, it wouldn't help us that much. If every day you got up and you went, where am I? (laughs) It wouldn't help you very much. And so it helps that we have this stabilizing part of our consciousness that automatically takes the memory images that we have and projects them and says, oh, that's you, that's you, this is this. And the same thing happens not over things, but over feelings and over scenes in our lives so that we have habituated a way of having a a way to understand everything. Right now, you came in the door, and what did you do when you came in the door? Other than the people who were wanting a copy of my book that I'm so sorry I had to be so rushed over. You came in and you sat down. No one that I saw came in here and was just kind of dancing. Why not is my question. Why? Because you have an image of what this is. You have an image of what you're supposed to do here. You have an image of what the expectations, which are also images that you carry in your mind, that are, your expectations are all based on the experiences you've had and the image you have that you carry forth from those. So if you could say, how is it that the Pharisees in this story that we were talking about had a little problem going is that they had an image too. They had an image of what a teacher was. They had an image of what the appropriate ways of being were. They had an image of what the teacher was supposed to wear, and particularly whether or not he observed the, you know, the cultural moray of washing hands. We can be blinded in the same way by the images that we have. We can reject people wholly out of uh, just they didn't fit the image that we had, right? I have found this to be true uh, a lot in religious settings. From the time I was young and I was a religion major at Centenary College and I was traveling around uh, with my good friend Bert Scott, who was a professor at Centenary, and he and I would travel around all over the place. Uh, He would talk and I would play and sing songs. But I was writing songs that were not quite the Jesus songs people were used to in the church in the early 70s. I was writing songs about my life and where I was finding meaning and all of that. And more than once, we would do something in a church, and people would come up after and said, when are you going to sing a song about Jesus? <laughs> and Bert laughs when he tells the story, because he says, my response at that point when I was, what, 20, was all my songs are about Jesus. At some level, they're all about where are we finding our sense of that wholeness that Jesus spoke to and invited people to, to a sense of Salvation, that's what the word salvation in the New Testament means, wholeness. Wholeness, not just for us individually, but as a community. Where do you find your salvation? I was finding it at that point not so much in the repetition of Scripture, because I had memorized a lot of the New Testament by the time I graduated high school, but I had begun to find it more in a relational context, that wholeness was found in the way we loved and and nurtured and cared for each other, and that somehow when people saw the good in each other and invited that out of each other, they were being Jesus in that moment. They were bringing salvation in that moment. And you and I have watched that a thousand times, haven't we? Haven't we seen people just blossom when they find a sense that we're not judging you? Your images may be different from mine, Your way of talking about God or talking about guns may be different from mine. But as long as we don't wash our hands of each other, as long as we can stay in connection with each other 
and find a way to move beyond the judgments and the rhetoric, we find ways to grow and sometimes to even transform the conversation into something that brings things that we neither would have expected. One of the things that I have done in my life that has had such meaning for me is working in schools and teaching restorative practices and working with organizations on how to use restorative dialogue. In my book, I share some of that, but the important piece to that in, in my experience is there is something sacred when people get down to the roots of a conversation. And the roots of every conversation, every argument, if you can move beyond the rhetoric, is can you tell me where you got your image of this? Can you share your image? And can I share mine? Without judgment, without blame, you picked up your shells wherever you picked yours up, and I did too. I recently had the opportunity about a week ago in the midst of all of the um, just polarization in our culture over guns. And in the wake of the shooting in Florida, I had the opportunity to sit down with a friend who is uh, a lifelong NRA member. And in the midst of all of the rhetoric that, te that seems to be going right now, and, and I, I have made my uh, perspectives clear. I've posted them on Facebook. But what I want to share with you is that it was so much more powerful to me to sit with her and be able to say, okay, let's just, you tell me. What do you remember from growing up in, in your life uh, in terms of your experience of guns, tell me about what were guns like in your childhood? Where, where did you first experience them? How did that begin to form your own perspective? And I shared with her mine. And as we, we talked through that, what we began to recognize is that in, in her growing up, it had to do a lot with security that she had lived in a fairly rural place. There was a lot of need for, you, you had to provide your own security. And she had some very strong feelings about that. She also had some other images that she had gotten from other people who had shared views with her. We talked about that. And then I shared some of mine. I, I remember as a, a young man uh, having a 20, my, my grandfather's 22 and going out and shooting pop bottles with my grandfather's 22. And, and I had a, a somewhat traumatic experience with that. I, I shot a duck. I didn't mean to. And the duck belonged to the guy who lived out there at the quarry where we were pop bottle <coughs> shooting and duck shooting, evidently. And I felt terrible. I felt awful. And I remember as we were quickly leaving, the, the guy came out of the trailer. Did you shoot my duck? And I was in utter shame. I felt such shame about it. And then I felt pain because his German shepherd was biting me in my leg. <laughs> and, and I had this puncture wound in my leg, which I had to hide for the next two weeks from my mother because I didn't want her to know where we'd been. I didn't want to share that story. That was about 13. So some of my imagery around guns carries some of that dynamic. So I ask you this question. Perhaps um, when Jesus said, two or, when two or three are gathered in the midst of them, I am there. Perhaps it isn't um, the task of our spiritual journey to have all the answers. Perhaps it isn't the task of our journey in our spiritual life to even repeat any particular prayers or have any particular knowledge. As Meister Eckhart said, if the only prayer you ever pray is thank you, that's enough. Maybe the task of our spiritual journey has always been to challenge us to open ourselves up beyond 
the limited set of images that we have and to discover the ways in which we can share with each other around a table the communion of the fellowship of life. And that the greatest uh, spiritual task of us today is beginning to question the automated aspects of the imagery that we carry. To begin to, to evolve our capacity not to change the fact that human beings are imagery-creating creatures and that we carry that habitually and automated, but to be able to begin to practice communing with each other in ways that can transcend the need for that certainty that I am right. And to be able to have the capacity to open to others images without judgment. I believe the polarization in our culture today will eventually cause incredible, terrible things in our culture unless we learn how to transcend the vitriol and if you want to learn how to transcend that vitriol, read my book. I couldn't sell it if I didn't believe in it. <laughs> because in my book, what you'll find is, here are the practices that you need to be able to step outside your imagery, to be able to see the imagery for what it is, and the consciousness, conscious processes that are going on that happen so automatically. You can't think outside the box of this cultural dichotomy of polarization until you can see the box. Most of what we try to do, we think we're getting outside the box, but it's just the box with some wrapping paper on it. And so what I want to invite you to consider is that we are, we are, we are challenged as human beings. And we are blessed as human beings. Just like all the other creatures on the planet, we bear the mark of this ritual nature. Just like the way a spider spins its web, or a turtle, as I saw once up by a lake in Minnesota, as a turtle does this ritual dance of burying its eggs. We, too, have this ritualized nature that, without consciousness to it, becomes something that robs us, can rob us, of our freedom. It, it provides us some of the greatest genius that we will ever know. I mean, no one could be playing these instruments up here without this capacity for the automation of, of imagery. But the same processes in a particular life define it. If I have a ritual, a, a, a pattern in my life, a habituated set of images that tell me that all people of color are not trustable because I picked that up somewhere along the way, that will define aspects of my life without me even knowing it. If I have imagery in my life that says it's okay to scream and yell because my parents screamed and yelled, so I'm going to scream and yell at my kids, that pattern that habituated pattern can really create some havoc in your life. If you've learned patterns in your life that tell you that the best way to deal with the things that you feel embarrassed about is to attack other people who are telling you about them, that will define, that, that habituated set of images will define aspects of your life. And God help us, we know that in our culture, there are people who do terrible things because for them what has been habituated in their image is that they experience other people like they were cardboard cutouts. They've never had someone or they've never had enough of that sense of human connection without judgment that says, tell me about where you learned to be you. Because yes, Virginia, even the image you have of yourself is incomplete. So, as I said in the song, perhaps, perhaps, 
what we might begin to try to do in this culture is to stop washing our hands of each other's differences, but instead engage in the communion and the dialogue, the restorative dialogue of being able to tell each other, where do we get what we got? And can we hold the images that we have gently, meekly, instead of turning them into weapons and attacking those who see them differently. That's my prayer. Thanks for having me come.